Welcome to this episode of World Culture. In this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share, and reuse what is available online and offline. The journey will make many stops, interviewing a variety of people ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians, to, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers. And we'll ask them, ask them how, they, um, how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. Today, our guest is Cory Doctorow. Welcome. Welcome. Corey. Thank you. Hello. Nice to talk to you. I'm, I'm very excited about, about having you on this, uh, on this uh, episode. Um, for those of you who don't know Corey, uh, he's a science fiction author, an activist, and a journalist. Um, he works for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He's an MIT Media Lab research affiliate. He's a visiting professor of computer science at Open University, a visiting professor of practice at the University of North Carolina School of Library and Information Science, and he co-founded the UK Open Rights Group. Um, you m might also know his blogs, Plur Pluralistic and Craphound, or you can follow him on Twitter and Mastodon, where he offers a daily mix of vintage and contemporary pop culture and digital rights activism. Um, so, hi, Corey. This is a very brief, um, very brief version of your uh, of your bio. You've done a lot more. Um, I know you, you're doing quite a lot of different stuff. That, that's fine. Uh, I don't know if you, want to add, if you want to add anything or if you I, want to I, introduce uh, yourself. I, I do a lot of stuff and I'm, I'm okay with people figuring it out on their own. I, I read a lot of books. <laughs> um, and, you know, if that's, that's one way to experience my work or you can follow me online or, or in any of the other fora in which I appear. <laughs> Um, well, you've written a lot of books. You're also um, writing nonfiction, and uh, in that uh, regard, I just want to um, mention the Shakedown. This is your upcoming book with Rebecca mm -hmm. Goodman about monopoly and fairness in the creative arts labor market. I'm mentioning this especially because she will be a guest on this. Oh, very good. Uh, on this podcast. Well, Rebecca is much smarter about so, this stuff than I am. Uh, that book wouldn't exist without her. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I look forward to listening to your episode with it because I could listen to her talk about this stuff all day long. Oh, that's great to hear. I'll make sure to pass it on. Um, so let's let's just sh start, shall we? So um, I'm going to read the question, uh, and then you can just uh, freewheel as Very much good. as you want to. Um, okay. So um, putting content behind a paywall is a means for press publishers to generate the revenue they desire. Um, of course, in combination, usually with the ad adver advertisement money. Um, but recently, this has been expanded to the small pieces of information of content that we also call snippets. Um, and these snippets um, are often claimed as a way to help the publishing, you know, like, no, levering attack, uh, sorry, levering attacks on these snippets. Um, it's also called, often called like a snippet tax or more formally as a ancillary, ancillary copyrights. Um, they're often claimed as a way to help the publishing industry re uh, to remain sustainable, um, although the data prove otherwise. Um, Given the very limited actual revenue taxes like this generate, um, proposals introducing this kind of tax, taxes should rather be seen as a means to limit the power of online aggregators. And I would like to discuss this with you. Um, do you think that that these aggregators, their power needs to be curbed if, if this kind of copyright law is, is at all useful for that, if we want that or why we want that or why you wouldn't want that? And uh, especially what the risks are if this type of legislation gains ground across the world. I mean, we're seeing this now. We've seen it in Europe uh, over the past years. This link taxes and uh, similar legislation is now being proposed in Australia, if I'm correct. I don't know that it's quite analogous on the Australia front. It's a little different there. Um, so I, I, we should acknowledge that the um, press is uh, in trouble financially, but it's important to have a kind of thorough longitudinal look of where that trouble comes from, because if you don't know what's causing the problem, then um, simply doing something won't necessarily fix it. You have to address the cause. So press, especially in the United States, underwent waves of mergers and consolidations, uh, starting with deregulation under Ronald Reagan and continuing under every, every presidential administration since. And those have followed a familiar pattern. So you had um, firms that were fairly decentralized, uh, with the ownership decentralized. Often, uh, newspapers were the uh, sort of the plaything of a of a patrician town father sort of person. It was in a it was a family business, and the way that those businesses operated was you had a local classified ad sales department that um, you know to a first approximation 
took all the people who wanted to sell appliances and convinced them to advertise to people who wanted to read sports scores. And the uh, revenue, the excess revenues were partially diverted to send people to go sit at City Hall and take notes on on council meetings. And um, with the deregulation and the mergers and acquisitions, what we saw were that these firms were gobbled up, turned into giant national firms. Uh, their local newsrooms were laid off in favor of central newsrooms. Uh, and also their local uh, sales staff were laid off in favor of centralized sales staff with the expectation that if you lived in, you know, East Pigs Knuckle, Arkansas, and you wanted to sell a washing machine, you would call a central office in Chicago and place the classified ad for your local newspaper. Um, and then those papers were loaded up with tons of debt. And that debt was diverted to their new owners in the form of special dividends. This is the beginning of the private equity playbook. And uh, many of their capital assets were sold out from underneath them. So uh, often their uh, physical plant, uh, sometimes their presses were sold out from underneath them and then leased back in an arrangement that allowed for more special dividends. So they were very hollowed out. Their, their cash cushions were taken away. Um, their local expertise was all but eliminated. Uh, and that's local expertise, both in news gathering and reporting and also in advertising sales. Um, and, uh, and then at the same time, they were made very vulnerable to shocks. Like once you rent a building instead of owning it, then if the landlord decides to raise the rent, you have to come up with more money. Uh, and so they, they had a much less predictable future. And then the internet came along. And so I'm not going to pretend that Craigslist didn't take a lot of classified advertising business away from newspapers. It sure did. Uh, but newspapers had survived many other technological shocks. They survived the newsreel, they survived radio, they survived television. One of the things that allowed them to do all of that was that they had cushions. They were run prudently like family businesses and not like piggy banks for uh, financial engineers. And so when Craigslist came along and, and diverted uh, the lion's share of that classified advertising revenue away from newspapers at Craigslist and then its successors, Google, Facebook, and so on, you ended up with a situation where they were very vulnerable indeed. And that vulnerability was multiplied by the other changes that had been made through these uh, corporate consolidations. So for example, Craigslist um, did offer enormous convenience for classified ads relative to placing ads in the newspaper. But what Craigslist didn't have was an army of local salespeople with deep relationships with local merchants who were accustomed to making sales calls on them and to uh, understanding their business and to helping them place ads that built that business. Unfortunately for the newspapers, they didn't have that either anymore because those were the first people to go in favor of uh, centralized phone uh, classified advertising. Likewise, um, as the internet came along, the major wire services, the AP and the UPI and so on, they all went online. And to the extent that these newspapers were primarily relying on wire service reporting, they all became the same newspaper, right? It, it became really evident that your paper and a paper halfway across the country were publishing almost identical material. And so there wasn't really any reason to subscribe. There wasn't any kind of local material. Those newspapers were then exposed to more shocks and so on. So that's kind of that. That's the moment at which kind of Google and Facebook enter and Google and Facebook over their uh, career, over the decades in which they've been consolidating, engaged in their own runaway acquisitions. They're, they're companies that grew entirely by buying up nascent rivals and engaging in, in anti-competitive mm -hmm. practices. So for example, Google is a company that is worth you know, uh, nearly a trillion dollars, uh, depending on the day of the week, but it's only ever made one and a half successful products in-house. It made a great search engine, a pretty good Hotmail clone, Everything else they do, they bought from someone else and everything else that they made in-house failed from Wi-Fi balloons to RSS readers. Um, so this, this anti-competitive acquisitions allowed it to build and maintain uh, a kind of anti-competitive wall around the business, uh, something that made it very hard to go elsewhere to place ads that allowed it to corner markets for ads. For example, the single largest customer Apple has and the single largest spend that Google makes is the money that Google gives to Apple every year to make Google the default search engine in Safari and on iOS. Uh, so that even if you you don't use Android, you're still a Google user. Uh, and what that meant was that Google and then Facebook could both separately and collusively rig the ad market. So today about half of the money that you spend on ads uh, gets trousered by these brokers. 
And they run these markets in a very dirty way. They, they are the buy side and the sell side of markets uh, that they also operate. So uh, imagine if NASDAQ was run by, say, a cloud company that both sold and bought technology services from NASDAQ listed companies and also operated the NASDAQ. And the cheating is really rampant. Uh, huge numbers of the ads that Google sells never show up anywhere. Um, uh, huge numbers of the dollars that Google and Facebook collect never end up in the pockets of publishers. And um, when those real-time auctions happen for ads, often as not, um, the, uh, Google and Facebook end up self-preferencing. So there's a, a whole esoteric business about something called header bidding, where newspapers figured out that they could list the ads on their websites in more than one place so that when you visited a website, lots of different auctions would take place in the same moment to decide uh, which ad you would see. Um, and what Google did was they figured out a way to detect if a newspaper was listing the same spot on more than one auction marketplace. And if they were, they would punish that newspaper in their search rankings. Um, what they would do is, is exclude them from something called AMP accelerated mobile pages and uh, newspapers that didn't have AMP couldn't, couldn't show up uh, in the top of the search rankings. And so their traffic would fall off. So this is where we are, right? You have uh, an intermediary in this market that sits between audiences and advertisers and publishers that runs a rigged market that allows them to skim off huge amounts of money. And the publishers themselves have been hollowed out and are the creatures of private equity firms for the most part and are themselves um, uh, not necessarily committed to the public interest, certainly less committed to the public interest than they have been historically. Uh, and to the extent that they really do want to do good, they're hampered by the fact that they're, that they're having all of their uh, cream skimmed off by these monopolists who sit between them and their audiences. And um, against that background, you see the link tax. And the link tax is a terrible, stupid idea. Uh, but the idea that newspapers might collectively bargain is not necessarily terrible and stupid. Um, there is a weird uh, um, kind of feature of contemporary anti-monopoly law that, uh, that was ginned up around the same time that deregulation happened that allowed newspapers to consolidate. We shifted from enforcing anti-monopoly law on the basis of a standard called harmful dominance, which basically means exactly what it sounds like. If a company is so big that its dominance is harming people, then we enforce anti-monopoly law against them. And we switched to a standard that was advocated by uh, far-right nutjobs like Robert Bork uh, called the consumer welfare standard. And the consumer welfare standard says that if a monopoly doesn't raise prices, or if you can't show that a monopoly raised prices because it had a monopoly, then you should just leave it alone. And um, the result has been that um, companies that uh, merge with one another and then raise prices are generally okay. Uh, merging together and then raising prices, uh, you would have to prove that the new company that merged raised prices because they merged and not because some input went up in cost. Maybe their labor costs went up or maybe they're in a more competitive market or maybe they have to pay more for energy or something. Um, and so generally speaking, when companies merge and then the new company raises prices, they're in, they're in fine shape. But if companies that haven't merged get together and collude to force higher prices from some intermediary in their supply chain, like when the book publishers got together to force Amazon to charge more for books, that's the one thing anti-monopoly law actually punishes. And so the newspapers are in a bind. Separately, they cannot hope to win any kind of concessions from Google and Facebook and so on. Together, mm -hmm. they violate antitrust law. And the only option they have to fix this that they can see that isn't some stupid thing like a link, link tax is for all of them to merge into one newspaper, which is not a good outcome. And so um, a, a collective bargaining standard is is not a terrible idea for members of the supply chain. It doesn't solve a lot of the other problems we have with the ad market or with the news market. Um, and certainly the fallout from a link tax is that smaller platforms, independent platforms that we hope might someday challenge Google and Facebook and the other major platforms are, are will never get off the ground because they can't navigate the compliance. They can't make the payments for the link taxes. And you know, at the same time, you have newspapers that have failed 
conspicuously to cover themselves in glory when it comes to issues like far-right extremism, the climate emergency, uh, and other forms of corruption and existential risk to the human race. And if a newspaper gets to decide who can link to it, not just charge for the privilege, right, but also decide who gets to link to it, then our ability to hold newspapers accountable when they make these grievous errors that have real human costs is hamstrung. You know, many years ago, I chaired a panel with Al Gore and Gore said um, that uh, he was worried that the big tech platforms were taking unfairly from Google and that we needed to have paywalls to pay for good journalism in the New York Times. And I said, but the New York Times told us that we had to go to war in Iraq because they had weapons of mass destruction. If there's a paywall, if they get to decide who can read their articles, then how do we hold them accountable for that? And he admitted that that was a good point, that he didn't know how to reconcile his belief that we needed to put the, the news industry on a sound financial footing with the idea that uh, adding paywalls limits our ability to have discourse around consequential reporting decisions by these media firms. I just want to I just want to uh, pick up on on something you said um, because access like this link text or, or in Europe it's also it's often also called like a snippet yeah. text. It was often framed by by local national politics and also like slightly at European level as um, you know it, it's it's harmful for these big big bad tech aggregators. Um, and you said you say at one point that. Um, this could actually, the biggest harm would be for smaller, very small platforms, very small startup, uh, startup platforms, news platforms. So it's, it's interesting that this, um, this type of legislation seems to be framed like against big monopolies and, and, and big tech and actually uh, um, those like hurting most will probably be like small, smaller independent news. Outlets, I mean, this is a recurring right? motif in copyright fights involving monopolists. Um, yeah. It's a trap that that entities that have real, like, legitimate grievances and worries about how monopolists conduct themselves fall into, which is to say to the monopolist, um, pay us a toll, shift a, a crumb or two from your side of the ledger to ours and it, as part of some complex regulatory framework, and we will stop bothering you. We'll go away. So pay us mm -hmm. to go away. And, and so that came up, for example, when the Authors Guild sued Google over Google Book Search, arguing that indexing books was a copyright infringement. And what they sought from Google was a $70 million payment, but also a concession that indexing books was a copyright infringement that needed to be paid for, and that you needed to strike a deal with someone like the Authors Guild in order to make that happen. And thankfully, the court struck that down, not because the Authors Guild couldn't have made good use of $70 million, but because what that would have established is that nobody else could ever index the books. It would have put all of printed literature in the exclusive hands of one rapacious monopoly. And for Google, $70 million is like how much they spend on free kombucha for low-level coders in a year, right? This is not a, a, a major concession to have wrung from them. And in general, you know, a monopolist's first preference is to not be regulated at all, but their second preference is to have regulation that only they can comply with, but that smaller firms that might do to them what they did to the firms that were dominant when they first entered the marketplace can, it can never uh, happen. You know, the Google entered a marketplace dominated by firms like AltaVista and Yahoo and so on. And, you know, if AltaVista and Yahoo had established some kind of rule, like you have to get permission from websites before you index them and had gone out and got that permission because they had a big uh, capital inflow to pay for that project, um, or if they were paying small dollar licenses for that, then Google just wouldn't have existed. At the time, Google would have fought such a rule. Today, such a rule would actually probably be pretty welcome to Google. It could pay, you know, a billion dollars, mm -hmm. which is which is peanuts for them. And then nobody would be ever able to start a search engine again, which I think is something that Google would quite like. Okay. We'll talk a bit a bit more about the publishing industry uh, later. Um, and by the way, you get extra points for every time you mention the word wall. <laughs> I noticed you've all, you've already taken care of that a couple of times, so um, you get you get extra credit for that. Um, 
Well, so so of course, uh, online pain walls are wanting, um, but something that you're also very vocal about uh, on your, at least on your social media and on your blog, is uh, is digital rights management. So uh, maybe we can go into that a little bit. Sure. Um, for the benefit of like of um, maybe you can just would you mind explaining what it is? Um, yeah. Digital rights management or DRM. Like in a in a very general way. Yeah. Well, I'll explain it in the in the specifics and then in the general. So, generally, mm -hmm. specifically, DRM is our technologies like say the thing that stops you from plugging a, a video recorder into your cable box or um, uh, downloading an app on your iPhone that doesn't come from Apple Store. And the idea is that it is some system that enforces rules that are created by usually a copyright holder on your computer. But more broadly, digital rights management is some system where a party other than you gets to give orders to a computer that you own. And when you try to countermand those orders, your computer says no. It's like Hal from 2001 saying, you know, I can't let you do that, Dave. So, you know, your <laughs> iPhone is capable of running any app. Um, your uh, uh, TV set-top box from your cable operator can output video to any video recorder. They just won't. They, they, you ask them to and they say no. And, um, you know, while I worry about the copyright and cultural dimensions of DRM, I think they're really significant. I worry a lot more about steaming towards this world in which everything is computerized, in which your house is a giant computer you put your body into, and then you fill your body up with computers, implants, and so on, and you surround it with computers and so on. And we design those computers specifically to disobey the person whose life they hold in their hands. Uh, and that seems to me to be just a foundationally bad idea. You know, I, I, um, Sometimes as a science fiction writer, I watch these these uh, space opera movies where, you know, they're fighting some kind of battle in their spaceship and the spaceship gets hit and everyone gets shaken around and someone falls and their elbow hits the self-destruct button on the bridge, you know, and a voice starts counting down like <laughs> self-destruct initiated in 10, 9, 8. And I always look at that and think, you know, I'm no aerospace engineer, but wouldn't that be a better spaceship if it hadn't been designed to periodically explode? And by the same token, you know... I'm I, I'm I'm not in charge of the technology industry, but I'm pretty sure that our computers would be better if they weren't designed to take orders from third parties, even if we thought those orders were not good for us. We thought that they endangered us mm -hmm. or didn't serve our interests. Yeah, so so it's I mean it's quite obvious that um, this doesn't serve user rights. I I think I've seen you writing somewhere that it also hurts uh, publishers. <laughs> Sure. Well, that's, I mean, that's a legal, that's, that's a legal question. So in 1998, Bill Clinton signed a law called uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. It has uh, rough equivalents all over the world. In Europe, uh, the Article 6 of the European Copyright Directive in 2001, uh, Canada passed it in 2011 or 2012. Uh, Mexico passed it last summer, summer 2020 in July, although it's before its Supreme Court for review. Um, and the law says that if there is DRM, then removing or tampering with the DRM or helping someone remove the DRM or telling someone information that they could use to remove the DRM, it's against the law. And in the U.S., it's really against the law. In the U.S., the law provides for a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense. And Critically, there is nothing about this law that requires a nexus with copyright infringement. So you don't have to pirate anyone's work or violate any copyright law. You can, uh, if you're me, right? If you're Cory Doctorow, proprietor of the copyrights of 20 some books and Amazon sells your books with DRM and you decide to take the DRM off your own book, you are the copyright holder of that book. You still violate the law and go to prison for five years. And so what this means is that every time a publisher allows a, a large monopolistic tech platform like Amazon or Google or Apple to wrap its copyrighted works in DRM, they give that intermediary, the retailer, the final say over how that work is used 
and um, whether that work can be brought into another app or another library. Uh, and that does not, that power does not rest with them. And so if, if I sell a million dollars worth of audiobooks through Audible, which is Amazon's audiobook monopoly. They control more than 90% of the fiction market and more than half of the New York Times bestsellers at any given time, their audio editions are Audible exclusives, meaning they can't be bought anywhere except Audible. Um, if I, if I allow them to sell a million dollars worth of my books and then Audible puts the screws to me, they, they start treating me worse. And there was just, uh, a huge scandal because a group of independent Audible authors discovered uh, tens of millions of dollars worth of wage theft that Audible had engaged in, just stealing money that they owed to these authors. And then I quit Audible. You as my customer, as my listener, as my reader, have to be willing to forego all the money you have spent. Collectively, my listeners have to forego a million dollars worth of works to follow me to a rival platform, or they have to get used to keeping their audiobooks in two or three or four or five silos. It's like buying books that, from Walmart that you can only shelve on a Walmart shelf in a room that you've put a Walmart carpet in and that you've got Walmart light bulbs in. And sure, you can then go somewhere else and buy a book from somewhere else, but you can't read it in the Walmart room where all of you, where all of your other books are. And you can't take any of those books into the other rooms. And so you end up where you're kind of path dependent, you're locked in to platforms that are controlled by companies that have demonstrated themselves not to have your interests at heart and have demonstrated their willingness to use leverage, this kind of leverage, against their creative supply chain to shift not a few crumbs from their balance sheet to, from your balance sheet to theirs, but, but all of the money from your balance sheet to theirs, as okay. much money as they can get away with and then some. Okay. Let, let me dive a little bit deeper, but I'll, I'll have to give some context for, for non-American listeners um, about this DRM, because usually people think that DRM is, is applied, I mean, typically would be applied to things like audiobooks, ebooks, your, your uh, DVD player, your laptop or your, your phone. Um, but you've written recently about an interesting case, um, um, the John Deere mm -hmm. case, um, which is linked to the, you know, the right to repair, hashtag right to repair movement. Um, so, um, as a bit of context, what happened there is that a tractor, the tractor, tractor manufacturer John Deere, which is one of the biggest in the world, I mm -hmm. think even, um, they claim that farmers cannot repair their own vehicles um, and they use DRM measures to prevent this. And so this means that farmers who are like to tinker with their tools uh, in order to make it work better for them are actually being considered as, as pirates, despite them having bought the tractor and, and, and using it. Um, so you've written about this quite recently, uh, and so I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that, if you tell us a bit. Sure. Yeah, it's that. actually far worse than you make it out to be, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> so it's not just farmers uh, fixing the, or tinkering with their tractors, although that's a big part of John Deere's history. And, and just, you know, again, to, to reinforce the point, the way that John Deere became more than half of the world's uh, tractor market was by buying all of its rivals. So it's it's another uh, um, industrial monopolist, just like newspapers, just like Google. Uh, that that's how it got there. It's not it's not you know some force of nature or something. It didn't make the best tractors. Just bought all the companies and made competing tractors. And Deere um, takes the position that uh, if you repair your tractor, you are uh, you have a requirement to have a John Deere authorized technician inspect your repair before it can work. And they, they do that through DRM. So uh, farmers typically replace their own, uh, fix their own tractors. You know, you, you, uh, you get a diagnostic message from your tractor saying a part has broken down. You replace that park and you're, you're ready to go. You replace that part and you're ready to go. But um, uh, Deere, uh, has engineered these devices so that after you put the part in, the tractor won't switch on until a technician comes out to your farm, charges you a couple of hundred dollars and types an unlock code into your tractor console. Now, farmers have fixed their own agricultural equipment literally since the invention of the plow. You know, if, if you're ever in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, you can go to a, a, the largest open air museum in, in Europe. It's a place called Beamish where they have a, an old Roman farmhouse and it's got a forge uh, because farmers fix their own stuff. 
Uh, because if you're at the end of a lonely country road and the thing that you need to bring in the crops breaks down and there's a hailstorm coming, you've got to fix it. You can't wait for the technician to come out. Now, deer knows this. Despite all of their, their, their talk, they say, well, you know, if you let farmers fix their own gear, they might break it. It could endanger America's food security or the world's food security or what have you. They know that this is the case. Um, they know it not least because the way that uh, deer grew to the point where it could buy all of its rivals was that they used to dispatch field engineers to go all around uh, to John Deere customers and observe the modifications they had made to their tractors, bring them back and integrate them into new tractors. Actually, quite a famous security researcher who's written extensively about this in response to John Deere saying that farmers uh, endanger the information security of their tractors by, by fixing them themselves. He says, my grandfather was a John Deere field engineer who holds 50 patents for John Deere for inventions that farmers invented that he went back and integrated into their production lines. So this is, this is um, John Deere unilaterally declaring the end of history, uh, the end of the era mm -hmm. in which that's the, uh, the kind of um, uh, way that we conduct our agriculture. And, you know, for Deere, the official rhetoric is about information security and about copyright. Uh, they often say things like, well, our John Deere tractors also have a music system built in so you can play Spotify while you're out in your field. And if you can modify your tractor, maybe you could pirate Spotify music, which is just a bizarre idea that we would put our crops at the mercy of whether or not farmers were recording Spotify songs from their playlists. Um, but they also say that because a tractor without its software is just an inanimate lump of metal, and since software is a copyrighted work, and since the title to the software is not transferred with the tractor, you're only given a license to the copyright in that software, then you are effectively a licensor of the tractor. You don't own the tractor. You really only license it, even though you spent hundreds of thousands of, or even millions of dollars on it. And you may have heard this idea that, you know, if, if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. I think that's totally wrong. I think the thing that determines whether you pay for the product is whether or not there's a monopolist who thinks... Uh, they can charge you for it. And the thing that determines whether or not you get treated like a product is whether that monopolist thinks they can get away with that. No one's giving away free tractors. No one's giving away free iPhones. And iPhones operate on the same principle that you can't get your phone independently repaired. And Apple makes the same arguments and they block third-party parts and third-party repairs. And they say that you could steal apps and they say that you could put yourself at risk and put your friends at risk and maybe the battery would blow up and blow your face off and just all kinds of strange arguments. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, it's just about figuring out how to extract more revenue per user. And again, no one's giving you a free iPhone in exchange for looking at ads. Uh, that is a thing you spend a thousand dollars for, and then they treat you like the product anyway. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, I think it's I think I think it's interesting that we can like pull this through to to like entirely different subjects and instead of only only digital culture and uh, um, digital digital culture. Uh, I mean, I think it's clear that that you know, of course, like I think the obvious rights that are being damaged here are like the user rights. But but I think in the end, this will, like you say, John Deere's ending history. Like it will curb innovation and it will curb new initiatives and it will make a threshold to for for new and small and startup companies well and, so big yes. and and deer has got a horrible security track record information security track record so you know to the extent that there is an actual risk that at some point we might get um we might get uh, uh an information attack a networked attack that shuts down tractors at a key moment um, that's a thing that's exacerbated by not letting third parties audit and repair John Deere's grossly deficient security software. So, you know, it, it actually creates the risk that it purports to be defending us against. Attack of the zombie tractors. Yeah. That's good or just, that's you know, ransomware for tractors, right? Nice, nice, yeah, yeah, yeah. nice staple crop you've got here. It'd be a shame if you didn't bring it in. And, you know, in, a, in an era of increased climate stress, uh, and more extreme weather, there's there's no room for downtime in agricultural equipment. 